Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's HiQ customer webinar. Uh, the title is How to Safeguard Your New SaaS Apps Against Ransomware. But first, let's get you settled in. There's a couple of us just joining. Uh, we'll do uh, a minute of introductions before everyone arrives. Once everyone's settled in, then we'll actually get started with the content. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items while we're getting started. This session will be recorded. Uh, the slides will be available to you. You will receive an email recap with everything. Uh, so if you want to share this with your peers, if you want to share this with other members of your team, all good. We'll be able to give you everything, including the recording and the transcript as well. Two things to remember. Uh, there is a Q&A in your Zoom panel. There's a Q&A button. Uh, if you have a question during the session, please use that. Uh, Mark and I will do our best to answer it live. Uh, if not, at the end of the session, we'll make sure to go through every single question and answer it immediately. In fact, if we have a little bit of time left, you can even speak up and provide feedback or ask your own question as well. Um, you're also going to see a little bit of a chat button there. Uh, we're going to ask some questions. There's a couple giveaways because we're really interested in your opinion. Uh, so there's the chat. But if you have a question, please, please use the Q&A button there. Um, but just as a quick recap, this is recorded. Don't worry, it will be available to you. But with that, let's get started. You ready, Mark? I am. Good morning, everybody. Perfect. Mark, can you see my screen? I can. Let's go. Okay, perfect. So for those who just joined us, the focus of today, we're really going to take a look at the cutting edge, especially from the threat side of the house. And today is how to safeguard your new SaaS applications against ransomware. Uh, just as a quick intro for, for those who might not know us yet, I'm Andy Fernandez. I'm the Director of Product Management here at Haiku. And Mark, introduce yourself, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Namayer, also part of the Product Management team here at uh, at Haiku. Um, really um, looking forward to today. So let's get started, Andy. Perfect. And just a quick recap of the agenda. We're going to take a look at some of the evolving threats that we've seen. We're hearing a lot of noise, a lot of market texture about AI. Let's actually understand what's real. What does it mean for your organization? How you should prepare accordingly? We're going to take a look at threat landscapes, how they continue to evolve, specifically in the context of SaaS applications in and outside of IT, and also cloud native applications and cloud native services. We're going to provide you an immediate plan of action. This is a plan of action that you can take uh, even without touching Haiku and being able to really start addressing concerns. But we're also going to show you how, as a Haiku customer, today you already have access to so many things that can help you address this plan of action. And of course, we're going to drive the Q&A at the end. But please do not hesitate to ask any type of question in the Q&A panel um, during the session. With that, something that I want to set the stage for today's session is there was a very interesting report last year called the State of SaaS Ransomware Preparedness. And they took a look at SaaS and they took a look at cloud applications. They surveyed over 10,000 organizations globally, not users, but organizations. And they asked tons of questions around the types of attacks that they were seeing, what organizations were hit, what kind of attacks. But something that stood out in this report was that out of the organizations that suffered a uh, ransomware attack. One, it was SaaS was the number one target, but 52% of those attacks were actually successful. I'm not gonna dive in on this yet, but I want you to keep this in mind that there's a 50% chance or a 50% success rate on these ransomware attacks. And this is something to keep in mind as we go through the scenarios. But what I wanted to share was from Haiku's product perspective, from what we're seeing in the market, what we're seeing not only already in examples today, but on the cutting edge, it's the impact of AI, right? And institutions, government institutions all over the world are already addressing this and starting to monitor and address what is the actual impact of AI when it comes to cyber criminal syndicates, cyber criminal groups, and individuals who are looking to exploit you, exploit your organizations. Um, this is a quote from James Babbage, but really starting to look at how they see AI being used. But let's look at very specific use cases and scenarios. So. Obviously, cyber incidents, cyber threats, terrorists, criminals have been around forever. Um, but a couple of years ago, we saw a massive spike in ransomware attacks, specifically because of the growth of what we call ransomware as a service. And what this meant was, you know, a decade, 15 years ago, if you wanted to execute an attack, you had to be extremely skilled. You had to be a developer, almost a full stack cyber criminal where you had to be able to create your own scripts, create your own malware, create your own emails, your entire campaign end to end, you had to build from scratch. Kind of like a data center, you had to manage everything yourself. Then ransomware as a service came out. 
And essentially was, it says, look, we have a marketplace for you on the dark net that you can start purchasing certain elements of what is a ransomware campaign, whether it's scripts themselves, whether it's the information of the people you're trying to exploit, or even how to manage decryption keys. There was entire organizations that came out that were marketplaces for cyber criminal activity. And ransomware as a service was a number one driver of the volume of the attacks that we're starting to see. But remember, this is before, you know, we started to see real Gen AI applications, real LLMs take precedent. Now, what does that mean for today? If ransomware as a service drove a spike, what do you think a jailbroken generative AI application or a jailbroken LLM will be able to do? We've already started to see extremely malicious adaptations of generative AI technologies, whether it's Wolf GPT, Worm GPT, Evil GPT, Fraud GPT, every single day, new of these services come out. And what do they actually do? Well, think of it this way. All of us have used some form of a chat GPT or a Bard or a Cloud today, and we've used it to improve our emails or for research or for anything else. Well, guess what? Cyber criminals have access to this technology and well, and they've jailbroken the underlying technology, purpose building it for crime. Let's actually take a look at some of the examples. So how many of us have gotten phishing emails that have been written pretty poorly? You can tell like a very technical engineer wrote it and it wasn't it have any marketing pizzazz. And you could easily tell that this was not a professional uh, email and you discarded it. But what if now every single phishing email that you had was perfect? What if now the criminal is able to simply prompt a perfect email? What if the criminal is now able to prompt and create a much more adaptable, much better uh, version of a malware script? What if user had the ability to leverage LLM for QA on their malware? What if the cyber criminal organizations were able to execute their ransomware campaigns faster, stronger, with more precision? This is the areas that we're seeing that are true forms of danger. We're not at autonomous malware generation yet, but we are seeing already even more spikes in higher quality incidents. We've seen crazy volume already, but what we're seeing is two things that are happening. The first one is the sophistication of these attacks um, is rapidly maturing, simply because that you now have a safety net in a jailbroken LLM that allows you to improve every aspect of your so-and-so ransomware campaign. But the part that scares me personally, the part that I see uh, being adapted ferociously is cyber criminal syndicates, actual groups that behave like enterprises. And they have departments, they have people who are focused on every component of a ransomware attack or breach or cyber jacking or crypto jacking, you name it. And what we're seeing is this is going to accelerate the speed of their high quality ransomware campaigns. So the point being here is we've already seen staggering growth and volume of attacks, it's only going to get worse. And we're also going to see a higher quality uh, in these high volumes of attacks as well. So this is something to consider that these attacks are not going away. In fact, they're going to get more sophisticated and they're going to get more personalized and delivered to you much faster. Now, because of this, we see recovery as a critical component. Every single day on the news, on Hacker News, you see organizations who fall victim to ransomware attacks. And we have spent billions of dollars in the industry focused on prevention, right? When we look at the NIST framework, and I want to talk about this in the context of SaaS. On-prem, you have, you're using Haiku for data protection. You have your storage infrastructure, you have networking, you have everything that you need. But when it comes to cloud and SaaS applications, the majority of the security bu uh, budget is focused on the identification, the protection, the detection, and the response but so few organizations have really focused on the recovery side of the house. SaaS and cloud are still threat vectors. They're very, very critical and they have to be protected, especially when you consider that how much money is being spent on cybersecurity every year in an organization and these attacks continue to be successful. So one of the critical areas that we see of, of growth as far as how these cyber criminals view it are SaaS applications and cloud native applications, specifically those cloud services that your organization depends on. But what I wanted to mention here is your threat landscape. You as an organization, the applications that are in use, the services that are in use are changing faster than ever before across your departments, not just within IT or within engineering or within DevOps, but across your entire department. And in fact, the number one risk that we're seeing 
is actually SaaS applications. Now let's think about that. Let's go back to maybe a more peaceful time, uh, 10, 15 years ago, where were your applications hosted? Applications mark like Salesforce, like Jira, um, like Microsoft 365, SharePoint Server, where were they? Well, they were server or data center deployments on prem. Don't get me wrong, there were, not, there were no benefits of this because you had to maintain and manage it all yourself, but guess what? It was one window. It was one place where you were able to track who's accessing it, how are they accessing it, and it was a limited threat surface. But where are we today? Every single major enterprise SaaS application is now consumed as a SaaS outside of your data center in somebody else's control that you subscribe to, right? Whether it's Microsoft 365, Box, your project management services like Monday.com, even on the engineering side. All of these services that used to be hosted on-prem are now SaaS applications as well. All the way from your IP to your CI CD deployments um, to even sales and marketing. Anyone with a credit card in your organization outside of IT can go and simply start buying and consuming very, very critical services. All of these, which used to be on-prem. Now, what this does is it makes it much more difficult to not only follow the NIST framework from response, protection, detection, but also it makes recovery extremely challenging. But something that I want to mention here was we want to hear from you, your organization, because as we talk to Haiku customers, as we talk to uh, folks all over the industry, we're always noticing the trend of your first guess of how many SaaS applications you have is always very different from how many SaaS applications the organization actually has. So what I'm going to ask is picture yourself as the IT manager or even CSO and CIO of a mid-sized organization. You have a thousand employees. And the question here is how many SaaS applications do you think that you're the average mid-sized organization is using? Don't think just IT, think sales, marketing, HR, legal. How many SaaS applications are they using? And the bonus question here is, what percentage of these applications were actually paid for and managed outside of IT? For those who get the closest to this, um, we're actually going to provide something pretty special. Mark, do you want to tell them what it is? Yeah, sure. Uh, we actually have Haiku branded coffee. I actually got a package of this in the mail yesterday because I was complaining about getting up so early. I'm on the West Coast. Uh, but yeah, basically, we, we have five of these available for uh, people that, like Andy said, the people that are getting really close to the answers and they they are actually pretty, uh, pretty shocking. So, folks, whoever gets close to this, a couple will get the special Haiku blend. And frankly, as a customer, tell us and we'll send you the Haiku blend as well. But give, think about it uh, uh, as well. How many SaaS applications does the average mid-sized org have? And what percentage of these applications were paid for outside of IT? Now, with that being said, let's actually take a look at the totals. So the first myth that we always encounter is, look, we only have a few SaaS applications. Uh, we have M365, Google Workspace, some flavor of that, and we have Salesforce. That's all we have to worry about. We're good. We have backups for those. And we also hear, well, also all of our SaaS applications are managed by IT. Well, when you look at the SaaS management index, this is an excellent uh, survey that was done across thousands of organizations globally. We found some very interesting insights. Number one, the average mid-sized organization actually has 217 SaaS apps. Think about that. Organization of 1,000 employees, 217 SaaS apps. And how many of those do you think were actually outside of IT? IT controlled 27% of the SaaS spend and managed 23% of the actual SaaS applications. So you had this threat surface that the organization thought was much, much smaller than it is, and they had much less control than they thought. And what this does is introduces a ton of gray area and a ton of risk that is extremely easy to exploit from the perspective of a hacker. Now, Here's the part that always gets a little tricky because there is a lot of gray area. People say, well, Andy, it's a SaaS application. That's the point. I, the provider is responsible for my data, not me. If I move to 365 or Jira or Salesforce or Okta, that means they're taking care of me, that they're performing all the maintenance, all the management. I don't need to worry about backup and recovery. But that's wrong. So think, put yourself in the perspective. Uh, let's use the analogy of a parking garage. Uh, you are going out on a Friday night and you want to park your garage downtown. 
when you park your garage, what, what is the expectation that you have from the garage? Well, it's that you can park, that the lights are on, that you can access, that you can pay, and that your car will be there when you get back. That's what the garage is responsible for, to make sure that you can use it. The system, right? Think of it as a system. But what about if you leave your window open and somebody steals your laptop or somebody scratches your car, dents it, slashes your tires? That's not on the garage. They take no responsibility. They take no liability for the theft, for the damage, for vehicles or contents. It's the same thing when it comes to your data in the SaaS. We call this the shared responsibility model. Every single SaaS provider uses it. And what it really comes down to at the end of the day is that the SaaS vendor is responsible for the system, the system as a whole, not you individually as the tenant, which means they have to keep the entire underlying infrastructure secure. The apps must be secure, data must be encrypted, they have to retain their own compliance, and they have to perform disaster recovery in case there's a regional outage. That they are responsible. And because you have a SaaS, you've offloaded that responsibility to them. But what about you? What about your car, your data, your users, your compliance? You're still responsible for it. Not only for making sure that your account is secure, that your data is classified, that you have the right access controls, but that you are compliant, but most importantly as well, that you're actually delivering your own backup and recovery. And if you're kind of struggling to come to this conclusion, go take a look at any SaaS application that you use. Send them an email or even just look up the company shared responsibility model and you will find direct quotes where they're telling you that you have to go and recover the data as well. This is a critical component to understand because your SaaS applications, even the ones that are outside of IT, if somebody goes out and encrypts it, if somebody exploits your admin, if somebody simply deletes or misconfigures that information, you as an organization are responsible for having to recover it. Now that's risk number one, that's SaaS. But as you know, there's an entire other threat landscape that follows the same rules. And those are cloud native applications and the services, the underlying services that power them. Think infrastructure, database, PaaS, all of these different services. But let's get on the time machine again. And let's go back to 10 years ago, even 15, 20 years ago. Once again, just like those business applications, your core applications, your tier one critical applications were also all on-prem. And don't get me wrong, so many of them still are, and they will continue to do so. But many organizations not only lifted and shifted, but they actually started to modernize. And if you're an organization that's started pretty recently, there's a very high percentage that you're fully cloud native. So whether it's hybrid or cloud native, things have really, really changed. So when you think about actually deploying production and using a cloud native application, for example, in something like AWS, what used to be a very straightforward on-prem management of disks and storage and servers is now the management of dozens of decoupled services that make up this application. And what does this actually mean? Well, it means that every single service that you're using that makes up this application requires you to pay attention to it to make sure that it's secure and to make sure that the data is recoverable. And I'll give you an example. So from CrowdStrike, they just released their 2024 incident report. And they've already mentioned that there's a massive increase in the amount of cloud-focused uh, exploits. Organizations trying to access cloud environments, cloud applications, and cloud services to wreak havoc in the organization. But something that I challenge everyone in the org to do, especially if you have some type of cloud footprint in your organization, is ask your DevOps team, ask your cloud architects to map out the services that you're using and understand Every single service, how is it protected? If somebody were to commit some privilege escalation, if somebody were to accidentally or maliciously delete something or misconfigure something, how are you prepared for that? Not only from a prevention perspective, but how can you recover that today? Uh, something that we see all the time is simply somebody accidentally deleting a role in IAM or misconfiguring a storage bucket. Uh, critical information is found there. And if you're not configuring it correctly, and if you're not able to recover it, you could be in tremendous trouble because of this as well. So just as a quick recap as well, though, once again, just like your Salesforce, just like your 365, just like your Jira, your Confluence, hyperscalers follow the same rules. And in fact, they've been around longer. They're even more straightforward with you. And they tell you, look, you as the customer, what are you responsible for? You're responsible for your data, your identity management, your configuration. And what that means is that you have to be very, very careful 
on how you protect, but also that you're making sure that you're taking the investment the same way you protect your on-prem applications, you have to do for cloud and SaaS because that's where the majority of these attacks are going. Now, we've gone through what we think are two very, very critical areas, right? To your threat landscape or threat surface, right? SaaS applications, the business side, and cloud services. But there's a small amount of data that is the most important data and configuration in the organization. And that's your SSO configuration, your IDP, your Okta, your Entra ID. So many organizations are being targeted this way. And we've seen these attacks all over the news where they're exploiting the SSO configurations, privilege escalations, giving themselves super admin roles and wreaking absolute havoc in the organization. Now, don't get me wrong. We think SSO is critical. We think MFA is a must have. That's why Haiku is fully enabled with these MFAs because we know that it's a critical part of your security and identity management posture. But that doesn't mean that it's not a point that you have to protect as well. Let's think about it this way. Let's grab your organization. Any normal organization kind of looks this way, right? Where you have your traditional applications on-prem, your infrastructure, your storage, uh, your networking, you have everything on-prem as well. And you're managing that and you're doing an excellent job. But guess what? There's some cloud everywhere. Unless you're in the federal government, there's some flavor of cloud. Maybe it's just hybrid cloud, or maybe you're fully cloud native and you're running prod up there. And already there are critical services there from a security perspective, right? And then you also have your business applications, your SaaS, right? Your 365, your DocuSign, your Box, you name it. What is the one thing that has access, that has the ability to change and access any of them. It's your SSO provider. These are the keys to the kingdom. These configurations, these data points are some of the most desirable data points for hackers to be able to do so. And who is it managed by? It's still managed by people. If something that we've learned after the billions of dollars that we've spent is that you could have the best, best of breed prevention solutions, the best of breed scene, the best of breed detection, intrusion alerting, the, everything. But as long as you have humans, there's always a chance that they're gonna get through. They can be socially engineered, no matter how technical, no matter how smart they are, humans can be a liability. Somebody can quickly click on a link. We've seen even very public attacks where they were simply socially engineered. Extremely technical identity admins were socially engineered. So the whole point here is, might only be a couple of gigs of data, but the configurations inside your SSO provider have to be protected because when somebody gets through and escalates privileges, you can always roll back in time to be able to do so. But we think this is truly one of the most important things that you can do uh, to secure your threat surface. But here's what we recommend. And, and, and Mark's actually gonna show you as a Haiku customer what you're able to do today. And we're very open to feedback because we want to make sure that we truly help you secure your entire data state. It's not just what you're using Haiku for today, whether it's Nutanix, Cloud, or a SaaS application like Jira. We want to make sure that you protect your entire data state. So here's our plan of action that we recommend. There's three things. The first thing is you have to know what's out there. You have to know what your organization is using. You have to map it out very precisely to know what's protected, what's not, and then triage from there. So a couple of things that we highly recommend that you take a look at, what kind of cloud services are you using? Just the basic ones from a compute, from a storage perspective. Take a look then from a security and from a networking perspective. What are all the security services that you're using? I'll give you an example. In AWS, you might think, okay, yeah, I have my VPC. That's, I'm good. Uh, we configure that effectively. There's six or seven other services that are used in parallel with that, that also need to be identified and protected. Things like 53, WAF, Parameter Store. These are all critical services that belong to security and networking that you have to protect, but you have to map them out as well. And then obviously your, your key management, your secret management, and then you get into the business side of the house, the engineering applications, right? What are you using as your Git repository? Is it SaaS? How are you protecting that? That's one of the most important components of your organization. How are you protecting your CI CD pipelines? What's sales doing? We, in our R graph assessments, and you'll see R graph shortly, we've seen CMOs with larger tech stacks than the CTO. And that's great, they're driving business, but you need to go and take a look because I guarantee you very minimal security practices are being followed 
let alone backup and recovery. And of course, you even have to go further in your organization, HR, legal, finance, they hold critical PII in your organization. There could be consequences for that, whether it's encryption for ransomware or breach as well. You have to understand what your organization is using. Then immediately, you have to go and start protecting and backing up your SSO configurations in case something does happen. That's at the SSO level, right? Whether it's your Okta, your Enter ID, Duo, Ping ID. You also have to make sure you understand your customer identity management. How are your customers engaging with your product, especially if you're, you're, if you're shipping product that third parties use, like Okta CIC or Cognito? And then guess what? Your cloud services have their own entire identity access management. If somebody gets access to that and you don't have a way to restore, you could be in serious trouble. And across all of these, whether it's cloud, whether it's SaaS, whether it's your SSO configurations, you want to make sure that you've automated the backups. Manual exports, relying on, a, on, a, um, on an IT support ticket for recovery is not a means of recovery. That's not demonstrable recovery. You want to make sure that your backups are automated. It's not just a, a few scripts that you're running, that the recovery is guaranteed, that you've tested it yourself, that you're able to restore very specific data to a point in time uh, previous to a breach. And three, two, one rule has never gone away. You do it on-prem, why, why not on SaaS? Why not on cloud? If you're still responsible for that data, three, two, one rule is critical. A bonus here that we truly recommend, especially for your SSO configurations, for your GitHub repos, uh, we always recommend immutable backups offsite as well. And ultimately, if you haven't tested the backup, then you have not, you do not have a backup. It's really critical that not only do you have testing, you have documentation, but you also have role-based access control. If you're the only person in your organization that can perform a restore, that's not effective. That's a point of failure as well. And ultimately, especially for those in finance and healthcare in the public sector, you need logging, reporting, and notifications across the board. We'll share this checklist with you. Our customer success engineers are well-versed in this, and we can help you go and truly identify this. But with that being said, I'm actually going to move the, the baton over to Mark, because Mark's going to show you how in your Haiku environment today, everyone on this call will have access. You'll be able to address several key points of this plan of action. Mark, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. You were on a roll, man. Um, couldn't even interject and throw some funny comments in and so on. But yeah, let's uh, let's do a little show and tell about how actually you protect uh, all of those assets that, that Andy was talking about. Um, Andy, if I can steal the screen, then um, I will share mine. And then... Boom, 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 boom. I think you should be able to see that. So this is what we call Haiku R Cloud. This is our multi-tenant backup as a service uh that that we that we run as a as a fully managed service basically that you can use uh to protect all of those assets that Andy was talking about. Um first and foremost of course we have integrated with the the major IDP provider so you can actually use single sign on uh to log into our service. So um in this case I'll log in with Octa but of course um, other uh, flavors are available as well. One of the first things you'll see is that, and let me uh, go to the subscription level, is um, a discovery tool that we have developed that we call RGraph. RGraph is designed to basically help you with discovering all of those SaaS services and all other data sources that you that are in use in your organization, but might not be managed by your central IT organization. Right, and we do this by integrating with Okta, with Azure AD, and more integrations coming later this year, that we use to basically uh, do a discovery within your organization. So we scan uh, these databases for fingerprints of services that we know. And then basically we visualize that in a very user-friendly way. So you can actually start looking, taking an assessment of your entire organization and start looking at, hey, do I actually use Box? Is it in use? But B, if what what about the information that is in Box? Is that mission critical for my organization? And does Box actually give me any uh, data protection capabilities themselves? Like Andy explained, um, yes, most of these SaaS services, they're very good at making the service resilient, but do they actually expose data protection capabilities to you Mr. or Mrs. Customer, right? And what we see in a lot of these cases is that um, the SaaS services 
they might do a little bit of self-store or they might give you a way of exporting data that you can. But none of these SaaS services actually have a green checkbox for all three of them. And we don't consider a SaaS service to be really resilient until they have automated backups, until you can do exports and some level of self-service restore. Right. So basically we we scan we scan the organization and we give you a score. Um, on the left hand side, you see all of the services that we can protect. And I'll show you the marketplace in a second as well. But basically for all of these services, we show A, are we protecting and how how many of these units are we protecting? And then B, when we're protecting, are we actually compliant? Do we meet the SLAs uh, that the business has given us in terms of how fast can I recover? Can I recover? All all those questions and so on. The cool thing is we roll this up to like the engineer or to like the department level, but eventually, ultimately, we roll this up to the organization level. Right. So within one glance, somebody like a CIO, somebody like a CISO can show, can take assessment of almost like the risk profile, right? How many data sources have I discovered? How many of those can I protect are protected? And within what is protected, how compliant am I? Right. So in our demo environment, we have about 230 data sources. We're protecting about a third of those. But of those that are protected, we're doing really, really well on compliance, right? So we give ourselves a green checkbox. Mark. Um, so that, go ahead, Danny. Quick question. Yeah, quick question, because we get this question all the time. What if what if they have multiple IDPs? What if you have Okta, you have Entry ID, maybe you have a lot of MA activity. Can you merge this to create one kind of master view of all of your services? Of course, of course. Actually, in, in our demo environment, we... Uh, we're both using um, Entra ID as well as Octa to basically um, have both forms of, of IM and, and SSL. Uh, so what you see on the screen over here is actually a combination of those. And we'll correlate as well, right? So you have, if you haven't configured in multiple sources, um, we will correlate those for you. But yeah, good question, Andy. Um, so basically, like I said, our graph is designed to give you a view of discovery. But what about protection, right? So basically, I can zoom in on engineering where I actually have, and once again, um, this is all our back enabled, right? So um, I can set up roles that just um, allow people to manage data protection within engineering, right? And you'll see Okta showing up over here. Um, we have Atlassian over here, but basically at the moment I get go into my SaaS services over here. Now you can see all of this, all of the uh, all of the data sources that I have discovered, and setting up protection for these um, is super super easy. Of course, first. Uh, you need to basically set up a source. Uh, like for instance, if I go for uh, for Okta, you'll see how easy it is. Okta Wick. Uh, you just need basically what is the organization UUID, what is the API token that basically gives us access to the API, so we can actually start discovering within Okta what are you using, um, how how can we protect us. That is step number one. Step number two is basically assign a policy. Uh, to this data source, right? So, and the policy defines what is my RPO or how often do I take a backup? How long do I take those backups for? And most importantly, where do I store these backups, right? Haiku has uh, a very unique um, mantra that we're, that we're really adhering to, that we're really proud of, is we never store backups within our own stack. We always connect back to storage that you own as a customer, right? So in uh, in 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 our demo environment, we can connect to S3, we can connect to cloud storage, we can connect to Wasabi storage, and we'll expand this over the over the next twelve months as well to go back to multiple storage. But in the end, um, from a data governance perspective, that gives you a very clean picture. We always store backups in storage that you own, that you lifecycle management and so on. So very clean. Um, everything is policy driven, like I said. So basically, the only thing to do to set up protection for Okta, for instance, is like I said, is to assign that policy. Uh, so in this case, we have we are protected with silver, right? And we if we go over over silver, you'll see silver gives uh, gives us the ability to take it back up twice a day. Uh, we keep snapshots around for a day. Those those are near line snapshots, and then we retain that backup data for a week. 
Do you want to stay uh, store these backups for months? You can do that. You want to stay uh, store them for years? You can do that. So you get that compliance checkbox as well, right? So if you want to, uh, if you're in a have heavily regulated um, industry, you can store configuration. You can store data for for years and years if you need to. Um, that is all you need to do. So set up the connection to the to basically the API token, and then assign the policy. That is all you need to do to be protected. So you can do a recovery. I always make the um because Andy Andy was talking about uh, the car park, the car structure, the parking structure, and so on. I call I for in a way at the moment you have the policy assigned. It's almost like having insurance. Now you're protected against whenever something goes wrong, whether that is accidental, whether that is maliciously done and so on. Basically at the moment you detect that something goes wrong, I can go in and basically do a restore of the entire organization, but I can go very, very granular as well. So if somebody messed up a policy, I can very quickly with just a few clicks, I can restore a single policy or I can restore a single user. I can restore a single application. And the way we designed, yeah, go ahead, Andy. So uh, one of the the requests we get all the time is let's run through this scenario. So Mark, I'm uh, I'm a sneaky fellow, and I manage to socially engineer somebody in the organization, and I escalate mm -hmm. myself to super admin. How how can Haiku help? What well, what is the scenario that happens there if you know something's going on, but how do you get back to normal? When that happens, so so, so I, I would say the first thing you do is basically you disable, disable all the users except for yourself, of course, right? And then you restore those users, right? And at that point in time, a they are back with their original level of 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 of, of elevation, but b they have to reestablish their identity, they have to recreate the passwords and so on, right? So in just a few steps, once you have that, and once you uh, are notified of that, you can recover very very quickly. And we're actually working on, and I'll do a little segue there, Andy. We're actually working on um, building anomaly detection within the product as well, right? So we'll actually notify you saying, hey, I noticed something fishy going on. I noticed a lot of changes going on. Can you check and, and make sure that this is actually legit? Or is, is somebody is, is going to, is basically working in the background to make a lot of changes and so on. So we'll help you flag that kind of behavior as well. But like I said, whenever you detect that something goes on, it's very easy to do a restore. Uh, the same for Okta on the customer side, right? At the moment, um, I noticed something on the on the customer side. Hopefully, it's loading. There we go. Um, now we basically can um, restore tenants and APIs and social connections and so on, right? So the uh, the level of restore is very application dependent. It's driven by the integration that we have developed for these applications, right? At the moment, I do a restore for Jira. I can restore tickets and attachments and 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 epics and things like that, right? In GitHub, you'll be able to restore projects and 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 uh, pull requests, things like that. So everything we do is very application specific, application aware. So for you as the admin for these stacks, it feels like you're at home, right? We we talk in the language that you talk um, each and every day, um, and we've done that. And let me uh, go to the marketplace over there. We've developed integration for a lot of applications. I think we're up to 65. Uh, we're actually um, pushing out an, another update tomorrow that adds a few more applications. So every month, every service update, we add a few more of these integrations to your list. So really, like Andy said, we're focusing on, A, can we protect the keys to the kingdom from an IAM, from an uh, SSO, from an MFA perspective? But then after that, really focusing on really everything that sits around DevOps that goes from building applications with source code repositories all the way to like CICD, pushing it out through test and dev to production, but then also into things like um, Cloud Run, where you manage how those applications get deployed and scale up and scale down. Of course, Notion and Asana and so on, that's kind of sit around that. So you'll see is really build to run, um, have protection for a lot of the applications over there. So yeah, all in all, I wanted um, to just basically uh, concluding, right? So sign in with um, MFA um, or, um, uh, stacks like Okta. We use, leverage Okta and Answer ID to basically do the discovery. And then I showed you in just a few clicks how you can set up protection. And then in just a few clicks, how you can basically do a very 
either granular or a project level recovery or organization level recovery in case something goes wrong. Andy, anything you want to you want to add over here? No, Mark, absolutely. And and one of the things that I love about this though is if you're using Haiku to protect your Nutanix workloads, your VMware, your AWS, it doesn't matter. It's the same user experience, the same policy management, the same restore experience. Um, if you were to protect every single one of your SaaS applications with a point solution, you would be managing 30, 40, 50 in the future. Like who's built to protect them all with one place? That being said, Mark, can you go to the marketplace real quick? Yep. There's thousands of SaaS apps out there. There's hundreds of cloud services. And we want to know, what would you like to protect? What would be most important for your organization? Maybe it's QuickBooks. Maybe it's something on the HR side. Maybe it's Workday. It doesn't matter. You actually get to request it on the uh on the marketplace itself. We actually do look at this. And as you know, with our cloud, we have this development platform where we can release things very, very quickly. So if you do have this burning need for a SaaS application, just tell us, we'll get it built very, very quickly. And it's just unified, just the way that you're protecting everything else with Haiku, it'll be on there for you. Awesome. Um, last thing I wanna add to uh, Andy, um, you can sign up for a free trial today. We give you full ex access to all the functionality and so on for at least a couple of weeks. And you can ping us. We can extend it in the back end very, very easily. But yeah, if you go to haiku.com, uh, go to the top right, basically um, sign up for a trial. And within just a few minutes, you're you're up and running. You can start uh, protecting your, your SaaS environments um, on-prem. Andy, back over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and we're really coming to the conclusion of this today. The whole point here is with the same rigor that we treat on-prem applications. We must treat cloud and SaaS the same way. They are easy targets right now. Great responsibility has been such a great area. And hackers and cyber criminal syndicates know that you have to protect your SaaS and cloud. Ultimately, it's your responsibility, just like how you're performing backups on-prem. So it's really critical to understand. Haiku, we wanna hear your needs. We wanna make sure that we can help you, that we can help you secure, not only visualize, but secure your data state as well from discovery all the way to security and compliance, all in the context of data protection. With that being said, what Mark showed at the beginning, being able to use your Okta, your Enter ID to actually visualize all these SaaS apps, that's where you start to address. That's problem number one. Many organizations are dealing with a lot of gray area. And you might not know which applications that you have that do have protection, which don't. This gives you an opportunity to immediately start and address this problem. Uh, so this QR code or the link below, you have Haiku Rgraph um, register. One of our customer engineers, somebody that you're already probably very familiar with, will reach out to you and will give you access to turn it on for free. It's yours forever. No issues, no strings attached. You get to use it or remove it as you need, but it gives you visibility. You cannot solve your problem. You cannot secure your threat surface if you don't actually know what it is even beyond IT, and we're here to help you do so. With that being said, Mark, I've got a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind, from the audience. Yep. Of so course. Mark, there's a lot of services on here that Haiku is protecting. How, how do you license? Yeah, so good question. How do we how do we license? How do we um, do the subscriptions for this? So it, 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 we really try to um, align with how the SaaS service, how, or how the service that we protect um, themselves is licensed. So for a lot of SaaS services, you'll see licensing or subscriptions on a per user basis. So you'll see that on our side as well. But in certain cases, that doesn't work, right? So if you look at uh, some of the databases that we uh, that we that we can protect for you, of course, then we um, will uh, sell subscriptions in that based on capacity, either the gigabyte or, or terabyte, and so on. And in certain other cases, it's 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 very application dependent. But typically, it's per user. $2, $3 per user for that insurance policy, right? So very easy to uh, to get going there, Andy. Okay. And Mark, you know, there's third-party backup vendors out there that store the data for me. What's the value of the data being stored in my storage bucket under my control? What, is, what does that mean? It, 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 it really gives a clean separation of responsibility and data governance, right? At the moment, um, say for instance, if I back up something like GitHub, like that is my IP. That is my stuff that I've been working on that I'm making money with, with right? It, it could contain very sensitive information around uh, CICD information, uh, domains and passwords and things like that as well, right? So at the moment, I know that that is in the end stored in storage that I own, 
uh, that nobody else can said, have access to that I can enable encryption and worm on as well right I can I can store backups that go into an encrypted bucket that are set to be protected for weeks and weeks or months and months and nobody can encrypt it or delete it or change it right all of that is in your control so you own the storage you own the life cycle management around that storage so it's just a very clean separation of responsibilities Andy no, it makes a lot of sense. And it's also having your backups, which is are highly targeted into somebody else's storage. It's just one of more course. point of failure, one more area that it can be exploited. So it's a huge reason why uh, we want to give you full control of your storage. But that, that being said, um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and or in the Q&A uh, panel, please. We'll make sure to answer them. If you have any questions you want to keep private, right, as a customer, uh, please reach out to us. Mark and I will leave our information. Um, but this is going to be part of our monthly series. So as a customer, we value your opinion. We're going to be picking different topics based on current events, but also interesting things that we're finding, new use cases, ways to be able to help you uh, improve your daily lives, especially with the use of Haiku. So if there's a topic, whether it's a type of platform or a use case that you're interested in, let us know. We will 100% make that part of our agenda and drive through. With that being said, the session is recorded. You will receive the checklist. You will receive the slides. Everything is there for you. Any questions, don't hesitate. Reach out to account management, to your customer success engineer. Um, but we've had a great time. We want to thank you for your time, your attention, and for being a Haiku customer. We're always here to support you anytime. Don't hesitate to reach out us on the product team. We always want to know how we can help improve your use of IQ and your daily lives. So with that, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everybody.